This video is sponsored by bootcamp.com. Check it out for INBDE prep and use coupon code MENTALDENTAL for 10% off. Hey everyone, Dr. Ryan here and welcome back to our dental anatomy series. This video is dedicated to the maxillary first molar. Finally, we've made it to the molars. So this is that maxillary first molar of the permanent dentition and using that universal tooth numbering system that includes number three and number 14. So this is the widest tooth facio-lingually in the entire mouth. That's a fun fact that is pretty important to know for the board exam. Now these first molars are quite something and I'm excited to tell you about them. So let's first start with the facial aspect. Now just like the incisors, this tooth crown makes a trapezoid shape from the facial view. The mesiofacial cusp, which is shown on the right here, is slightly wider in a mesiodistal dimension than the distofacial cusp. It's subtle, but it's a slight difference. Now by contrast, the distofacial cusp is slightly taller than that mesiofacial cusp. Even hard to tell on this drawing, it's so subtle, but just wanted to point that out. The facial groove, which we'll be talking about a little bit more later, is just about at the exact center of this tooth. It's also in line with the palatal root, which is poking out behind there. You're going to notice this in the next video when we talk about the second molar, but this facial groove here is going to migrate in a distal direction when we get to the second molar, and even more so when you get to the third molar. The roots of this tooth are what we might call bow-legged or spread out, so you can see how they kind of spread out from each other, they diverge from each other as you go from the root trunk area towards the apex. Now, again, when we get to the second molar, they're more parallel or convergent as opposed to divergent as we see here. From the lingual aspect, you can see this giant palatal root sticking up like a mountain peak, and we also get a good look at the cusp of Carabelli. This is a special little feature unique to the maxillary first molar and it was discovered by a dentist named George, you guessed it, Carabelli. And it comes from a fifth developmental lobe. Now the only other teeth to form from five lobes are the mandibular first molar and that Y-type mandibular second premolar that we talked about in the last video. But regardless, that cusp of Carabelli is going to be attached to the mesiolingual cusp. Just like the facial groove, the lingual groove is at the center of the tooth, once again in line with the palatal root. And that too will migrate in a distal direction as we get to the second molar. All right, for the mesial aspect, we can see a couple interesting things. The first I'll point out is the shape. The crown forms once again a trapezoid shape. And this is the first tooth we talked about that is trapezoid shaped from both the front and the side views. As far as the roots are concerned, we can see the palatal root that we were just looking at before. This is the largest root, also the longest root of the maxillary first molar. You can also see how it kind of goes outside the bounds of the crown. It really sticks out quite far. The mesiofacial or mesiobuccal root, which is right in our faces here, is the second biggest root, and it's the widest one in a facio-lingual dimension. And the reason for that is we need to have room for two separate pulp canals, and we'll get to that a little bit later in the video. Now, that distofacial root is hiding behind here. We'll see it in the next slide, but that is the smallest and the shortest root. Here's the distal aspect, here's that small distofacial root we just talked about, and the distal side is always going to be physically shorter. You can see most of the occlusal table, thanks to that short distal marginal ridge. The distal CEJ is always flatter. You know all of those fun facts already. For the maxillary posterior teeth, 
Those facial cusps are referred to as non-holding cusps, whereas the lingual ones are called holding cusps. So basically the idea here is that these facial cusps don't touch any opposing structure in the ideal bite, and they help to hold the cheek out of the way. Whereas the lingual cusps are designed to contact opposing teeth, and thus they are shorter, blunter, and generally have more mass. And then the opposite is true for the mandibular posterior teeth. The lingual cusps are the non-holding cusps. Their job is to hold the tongue out of the way. And the facial ones are the holding cusps, again, that are shorter, blunter, and generally have more mass. Also notice how the teeth are naturally inclined in such a way that the holding cusps are located or positioned over the center of mass for each tooth. So that's pretty interesting as well. We'll talk in more detail about this later in the series when we discuss occlusion. From our first video in the series, we talked about the root trunk, which is the area from the cervical line to the furcation area. On average, the root trunk will be about three millimeters on the mesial surface, four millimeters long on the facial, and five millimeters long on the distal. So the mesial furcation is closest to the CEJ, and the distal furcation is furthest away. Another way to say this is the root trunk is getting longer as we move distally. All right, this is one of the most important occlusal views in the entire series, so we're going to take our time with it. As far as the shape is concerned, this one looks like a rhombus that's pointing towards the mesial. It's skewed in a mesial direction. The tooth converges toward the facial. So in other words, the lingual half of this tooth tends to be a little bit wider than the facial half, making it the only tooth that is often wider on the lingual half than the facial half. It also converges toward the distal, making it wider in the mesial half than the distal half. The oblique ridge is one of the most important structures of this entire tooth. It connects the facial surface and the lingual surface of the tooth in a diagonal fashion, hence the word oblique ridge. It gives this big tooth a lot of strength. Often when we're doing cavity preparations, we wanna stay away if possible from breaking through that oblique ridge because then the tooth loses a lot of integrity and is more prone to fracture down the line. To me, it kind of looks like two pyramids that are butting up against each other. And I think it looks like this sentry enemy comes from this game that I play on my gaming channel called Slay the Spire. If you imagine that orb wasn't there and those two pyramids were collided together, that's kind of what this looks like to me. Two pyramids back to back creating this unique structure called the oblique ridge. Of course, we also have the distal marginal ridge over here. We have the mesial marginal ridge over here. The central fossa is right in this area. That's the largest one. We have the distal fossa just to the left of the oblique ridge. And then we have the distal triangular fossa and the mesial triangular fossa, which are the smaller ones. There's also this feature called the primary cusp triangle, and I want you to think of this like a giant pizza slice. So it encapsulates three cusps, the mesiolingual cusp, also sometimes called just the palatal cusp, the distofacial cusp up here, and the mesiofacial cusp up here. And so it rides along that oblique ridge and encapsulates the majority of the tooth and unfortunately, the distolingual cusp gets left out of the party. But I do want you to know which of the three cusps are included in that primary cusp triangle pizza slice. And then you can also see the tiny little cusp of Carabelli right there. <laughs> 
Now, not every maxillary first molar will have that cusp of carabelli. Some will have it where it's really prominent, and some may not have it at all. Now, this slide will be dedicated to the various grooves on the occlusal surface. Here we have the lingual groove, which we talked about before. That extends onto the occlusal surface and becomes the distal oblique groove, which ends in the distal pit. So I'm going to count that as one giant groove there. Then we have the central groove, which runs from the mesial pit to the central pit. We also have the facial or buccal groove, which we also looked at before, which connects from the central pit down onto the facial surface. The last one is the transverse groove of the oblique ridge, and that connects the central pit and the distal pit. It's not really a fissured groove. It's more a, an abstract coalescence of two developmental lobes. In the maxillary second molar, it's usually more fissured, and it will be a little bit more apparent in this drawing. As far as the pulp is concerned, there is one pulp horn extension for each major cusp tip. That shouldn't be a surprise. So since we have four major cusps, there should be four pulp horns, and that is true. The cusp of Carabelli is unfortunately too small to have its own pulp horn. As an interesting side note, the mesiofacial pulp horn is unusually tall and prominent. This is also true for the mandibular molars. And as far as the canals, we have some interesting things going on here. So 70% of the time, they have four canals. 30% of the time, they have three. And while there's one pulp horn for each cusp, the canal entrances or orifices all favor the mesial half of the tooth. The mesiofacial root usually has two of them, one of them being the infamous MB2 canal or mesiobuccal 2 canal. And I say infamous because it's one of the hardest canals for dentists and endodontists to locate and instrument. In contrast, the largest diameter pulp canal is the lingual or palatal pulp canal, which makes sense because that's also the largest root, as we talked about before. And then that small distofacial root will also have one small distofacial canal. As was the case for the occlusal view of the crown, the midroot cross section in white here also follows a rhombus shape. The root apices of this tooth tend to approximate the floor of the maxillary sinus, which we can see in this panoramic radiograph. All right, a summary of the maxillary first molar. So this tooth is, again, the widest tooth facio-lingually in the mouth, so of course that's going to be the largest dimension. Not far behind, though, is the mesiodistal dimension, and lastly, occluso-cervical, which will be a trend that you see in all of the molars. That occluso-cervical dimension is now the shortest because the teeth are getting shorter and shorter as we go posteriorly. This tooth is characterized by a couple of things, not least of which is the cusp of carabelli, that oblique ridge, and that pizza slice primary cusp triangle. Speaking of the cusps, we have five of them, and from largest to smallest, they are mesiolingual or palatal cusp, followed by mesiofacial, then distolingual, then distofacial, and then cusp of carabelli. And then we have four grooves and three pits. So it's nice to remember five, four, three. The tooth crown takes a trapezoid shape from the facial view, trapezoid shape again from the side view, rhombus shape from the occlusal view, and then again rhombus shape from the cross section, and then lastly consists of four or five lobes depending on the presence or absence of a cusp of carabelli, and primarily has four pulp horns and four pulp canals. That's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Please like this video if you enjoyed it, and subscribe to this channel for much more on dentistry. If you'd like to support me, please check out my Patreon page. And thank you to all of my patrons for their support.
You can unlock access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions for the board exams. So go check that out. The link is in the description. Thanks again for watching everyone. I'll see you in the next video.